All right, coaches, we'll make a start um, to our uh, session tonight. Um, obviously, very lucky to have DP and Herbie, both current Australian under-19 head coaches, uh, here presenting um, for us tonight, which is, is awesome. Um, and uh, very lucky to continue the, the quality of, of, um, and calibre of people we've had so far. So really looking forward to that. Um, the usual housekeeping, please make sure you stay on mute um, so we don't detract from the presenter. And also, if you've got questions throughout, just flick them through to me um, and I'll ask at the appropriate time or at the end of each presenter's um, clinic. So, um, firstly, we're starting with uh, DP, Darren Perry, um, current Australian under 90 men head coach, um, NBL1 head coach for Dandenong and has been for a long time, long time Victorian state coach, NBL player, and a lot of different bits and pieces over time. Um, very experienced coach and player. And we're lucky to have him on tonight to present on uh, using data to drive your coaching decisions. So I'll hand over to you uh, now, DP. Thank you very much, Reese. Um, you know, I've got to figure out this technology uh, to, to get myself up on my uh, presentation up on screen so that uh, you've got something to follow. As I suspected, uh, let me you got it share there you go are you able to see <laughs> what is on the screen i think you can yeah, we've got how to make adjustments at the moment yeah well that's probably not the, the place to start uh, <laughs> we might we might go right back to the start um apologies to all well, thanks for uh for tuning in and uh, you know, thanks to Reese and Wyndham Basketball for the opportunity to, to talk about these things. Um, um, we all are enthusiastic about the game and, and we, we love watching our video. We love um, you know, preparing playbooks and, and putting together a plan uh, to go and conquer the basketball world. Um, Tonight, I want to just touch on uh, a little bit of a, a game that is part of it all. Um, but data, I think, has a place um, in what we do. And uh, it's not just the, what we would, I would call the normal um, data, which is yeah, box score related, scoring, rebounding, um, and the usual, I suppose, uh, things that we like to focus on, um, you know, when we're we're coaching, whether it's uh, you know, if we're all fortunate enough to to coach, uh, where you know you get a printout of of the the box scores at the end of the quarter, and um, you know, I tend not to look at the box scores during the game. You know, I leave that to my assistants to quickly comb through and, and try to, to ascertain how we're going and what areas you know, we, we may not be going well in. Um, you know, first of all, you know, what data is important to you as a coach? Um, you know, clearly, you, know, you look at the box score and, and to me, if, you, if you're coaching a game and by quarter time, half time, you haven't figured out that you're not shooting very well from the three or, or, uh, or the two, or you, you've been turning the ball over a lot. Um, I think you, we may not have been you know, focused on what, what's going on. I think uh, the box score certainly uh, is reflective of what's going on. Um, but it's, yeah, for me, it's, a, um, it's, it's just a summary of, of how the players are performing their skills on any one night, you know, whether that be by shooting, you know, making plays, assists, stealing the basketball, um, and uh, collecting their, their statistics that way. Um, you know, I, I also like uh, what I would call my own customized statistics, which if you look at the, the pyramid that sits in the, in the middle, um, most of what we are trying to do out there in the game to get the statistics um, has got to do with, you know, some other things that might be, you know, important. Um, if you look at the, 
you know, deflections where I say it'd be great to get, you know, more than 40 in a game. You know, it's easy to say that and it's easy to say, well, you know, it's one per minute, you know, and uh, there's clearly plenty of you know, possessions in a game. Um, yeah, I think we should be able to get more than 40. Um, but depending on how, you know, what style you play with, uh, if, if I've decided that, uh, you know, I don't like uh, our chances of getting up the floor and you know, creating disruption and, and getting our hands on, on passes and, and potentially, you know, stealing dribbles of uh, basketball players as they come up the floor. Um, and I've, I've retreated into a half court. Potentially, uh, I may be taking away the opportunity of the players uh, to go and get that, you know, 40 deflections. You could argue then, well, you know, surely that they'll be able to get in passing lanes, um, put pressure on getting passing lanes, um, you know, depending on what type of attacks, you know, we're, we're trying to face. Um, if, you know, you don't feel like you can pressure as well as, you know, you, you, you know, to force these deflections, well, you know, maybe we'll have to go a little conservative. Now, if we go conservative, I don't know how we're going to get our 40 deflections in a game. So, in the plan, if I'm expecting 40 deflections, I've got to have a game plan that gives the players the opportunity to go and meet that goal. Um, it also will speak to the type of game that we want to play. Um, for those who have seen any of the teams that I play, yeah, full court uh, defences are part of, of what I do. and Zone defences are part of what I do. Um, and all of these differences, you know, can create these deflections. And, and the deflections uh, that I talk about is, yeah, full steals, but even just hands on any pass, uh, it does reflect the type of play that, that, and the type of aggressiveness that we are showing on our defense. Um, saying no straight line drives, it's a difficult one to achieve, but um, anytime you know, other teams are able to go straight at the hoop, it's going to increase our foul count. We're going to give up scores and the general feel of the players when they're on the floor is that we've lost control. You know, we, we don't have control of the game. So to put it as a no straight line drive is, is delivering a message to the players that they have a high standard to uphold um, you know, sure, we may, may, we may give some up, um, but their intention has got to be uh, they've got to keep, that out, keep the basketball out at all costs. Um, if you go to the bottom line, you know, greater than 10 over the opposition in terms of total rebounding, it's difficult to achieve, and, and it depends on the level that we're playing. The, this, this pyramid was uh, a plan to go to the Under-19 World Champions to, uh, world championships with last year and you know to out rebound Canada by 10 was was difficult Mali by 10 uh, any of the teams uh, that we played against it was a it was a difficult ask for us and so prior to the tournament you know we felt like if we could dominate teams on the glass uh, that would uh, result in wins for us um, go along the line, keeping teams under 68 points, important. Um, we've also got a, message, a, a measure of uh, feet in the paint. Now, feet in the paint can be achieved in a number of ways. It could be a you know, drive to the basket or a penetration into the paint for kickouts. Um, it could be a pass to a cutter in the key. It could be a pass to a low post player. Um, but we wanted to put pressure on the key way as often as possible. Uh, and we felt that we played best uh, when we attacked the paint. And then if we had to kick out and play from there, uh, we were pretty effective. Um, as we go through the presentation, uh, I will show you the result of that particular measure as as it were at the world championships in and our success rates of the times we 
went in offense and got our feet in the paint. And then the difference between that success rate and not getting in the paint, transition three, uh, you know, couldn't penetrate, shot clock running down, had to take jump shots. Um, it's quite a significant difference in effectiveness. Um, and we'll have a look at that a little bit later. Um, I don't know if you can see on the top right of your screens, uh, my you know, head's in the way of, of uh, that little box on the top right hand side. And it's, it's a summary of uh, a player of mine in the NBL one season. Um, you know, many years ago, uh, if we track back to the left hand side, this is you know, the individual impact or plus minus uh, that people talk about. I've been tracking players uh, individually and in lineups for many years. Um, I've got a, a colleague of mine, Mike Funky, who has uh, over the years built a significant program, a tool uh, that allows us to uh, look at the individual and look at the lineup that that individual plays in. Um, and in, in that box, I'm not sure if you can see it, but it's a list of the games that we've played, the impact plus or minus of the total uh, that that player played. He could have played in five, six, seven, eight different lineups, 10 different lineups, and it'll take an aggregate of the scoreboard impact over that time frame and obviously the, the amount of time played. The corresponding uh, look at that impact, I think, means more to me when I'm able to see who that individual has played with. And that's the, the elongated table at the bottom. And if you look at that, that's uh, our NBL one, one of our lineups. It's the starting lineup uh, from last year, and it's a, just a snapshot of five games. And so what we were able to tell from you know, looking at that lineup was how often uh, that lineup played, when did they play. If you look at the quarter one, two, three, or four, uh, we didn't get to too many overtime uh, opportunities in, in this little group of games, but that's quarter number five is the overtime. And so on the bottom right, it'll give you the summary of the amount of minutes in each of those quarters that those lineups played and the result. And as you can see, uh, even looking on the left-hand side against Diamond Valley, uh, the, the starting lineup had a solid start to the game at, at plus two, had a better second quarter and matched the effectiveness in the third quarter uh, and had a significant impact as a group um, over the course of that game. Uh, it wasn't quite as good against Ballarat. If you look down a couple of pegs, um, played a little bit less. Uh, and uh, Ballarat obviously got off to a good start and changes needed to be made. Um, and if you look at that profile, uh, we tended to play the starting lineups at the start of the halves, uh, almost it, you know, ex clearly, um, uh, because we felt that was our our best lineup to start the action. The interesting part about reading this small table is that the starting lineup were far more impactful after halftime. Um, as you can see over the uh, the top line. Uh, over the course of the five games uh, as a plus 39, plus 25 in the third quarter, which was a little to do with um, the lineup itself, but also um, what our plan was coming out of halftime. Uh, we tended to uh, hold on to some of our full court pressure. Uh, we played it in small snippets over the course of the first half but then felt uh, getting a jump out of halftime and coming up into the full court, you know, we definitely got our value. Um, and this group did a good job. Um, 
the the lineup itself uh, wasn't the starting lineup for the entire year. Um, you know, we had one guy who was a college-bound athlete in the starting lineup, which was a credit to him at a young age. Uh, and then our profile had to change, and you know, we we had to look and see, you know, how we played and and um, could we play the same way um, with a different lineup, um, which is essentially how uh, you know this you know, other game that sits outside of the box score is who who's out there what are they doing if you've got a lineup that continually um, is highly Im- impactful fine um, it's an easy one to say oh well we'll just keep playing those guys together um, the the interesting part about it all is you know even the starting lineup um, you look at the number of minutes that they play together in the game, a 40 minute game and they played well together. And you know, yet I still only played them 13 minutes and 25 seconds for a plus 18 result. And what does that tell you? That there's 27 other minutes with all sorts of other lineups that will have a, uh, not the same profile as what you're looking at now, uh, but they will have all kinds of different profiles. And, and it's those profiles that I am interested in, um, not just because I can say, hey, this group of five guys um, is really effective and th- this group isn't. What I need to be able to do is figure out, can the five play together for extended periods? When does this five play well together? Against what defense does this group play well together? What kind of offensive sets are we running or what kind of style is our offense when these guys are playing together uh, to be able to you know, make decisions, tweak the offense, tweak the defense, change the defense, um, perhaps get more aggressive, play quicker, play slower um, to be able to uh, allow those guys to survive on the floor uh, without having to make a change. So that's just a, a, a brief introduction of different types of data that could be used. Um, the data that you see, the individual and the group, uh, you, it's, you know, Mike and I have got to the point where we can just write down the people that are on the floor and, and the time and the, and the score, and then the new lineup. Uh, we're able to collect it by hand. We don't necessarily need it in uh, you know, a, 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 you know, a statistic type of framework with the box score and the play-by-play, uh, we're able to to collect that and and show um, you know those trends and and the the performances of each lineup as we go. Um, uh, so it's it's valuable to junior groups if you all are sitting out there thinking, all right, well, how would I you know, how can I collect this data and how can I get that? Well, um, you know, Mike's out there and there are other people out there that are willing to help, uh, help you as coaches uh, to, to try and find information that's going to help you. Now, if we move, move along and, you know, there's, there's, there's more questions around you know, what do you want to know? And what do you want to know about your team? And um, there's a, a, another table uh, that's um, on this screen that is, is team related. And it's not, it has nothing to do with lineups and it has nothing to do with individuals, yet it's, it's telling you a lot about your team. Um, and if you, you know, as you can see at the top of, of that table, it's the 2017 Dandenong Rangers Siebel men's team. And what, you know, this is away from, you know, what we just talked about. When you are coaching teams and they do collect stats, um, what are the stats that are going to mean something to you uh, in terms of a win and a loss? Uh, we all have a thought in our head about 
uh, all right, we'll, yeah, we'll play like this. And, um, you know, here, here's our playbook. Here's our defenses. I'll sub people in and out. And, and uh, we're just going to try to win the basketball game. What we wanted to know with this list was what stats mean something to, to the result. And if you look at the top line, of total rebounding compared to the opposition. It was an average, you know, so um, the, there's a win loss that sits behind. I, I can't see it, but uh, I'm not sure if you guys can, where there's a win and a loss if you achieve the, the KPI. So if you achieve the KPI, um, then has that resulted in, a, you know, just that line resulted in a win or a loss. Now, in the 2017 season, rebounding, what, you know, if we out-rebounded the opposition, it didn't, it didn't guarantee us a win. Uh, in fact, um, it was probably a half and half, 11 wins, nine losses. Uh, if, you know, our KPI was to, you know, have less than 12 turnovers in a game, you know, I think it's a good stat. It's still, you know, you look at the difference between, you know, the wins and the losses. It didn't really make as much of an impact as you may have thought prior to trying to force opposition turnovers more than 15. You know, it was a little bit uh, more of a, a, a factor, but the three, you know, without going through all of them, the three statistics that guaranteed us a win was keeping teams under 80 points and that year um, when we kept teams under 80 points we were 15 and 0 so as we built our uh, plan as we built our strategy we needed to continue to create our uh, opportunities or uh, player style that you know, kept those teams under 80 points. One of them, obviously, is to play very good half-court defense, half-court man-to-man defense. And if you're able to, you, you're not giving up uh, many you know, easy baskets to the other team. Getting back on defense clearly is, was a factor uh, in limiting transition opportunities and also... Uh, changing of defenses uh, that year we we definitely came up the floor um, but we didn't always press to trap and try to steal but we de we definitely came up the floor to an, uh, annoy slow teams down and then try to guard the last eight to ten seconds of the shot clock effectively um, you know that team uh, the 2017 Rangers um, went all the way to the grand final, lost in the, in the final to Mount Gambia in a pretty good game. Um, but we felt like we, we had a stat that we could rely on uh, when it came to wins and losses. Getting to the free throw line more than 25 times. We didn't do it that often, but when we did, we won the basketball games. If we shot better than 50%, we won basketball games. And, and the one in yellow... Uh, when we kept the opposition to under 45%, uh, we gave up one game. The only, there was only one game when we kept the opposition below 45 that we lost. So uh, when we're trying to think about statistics, um, you know, what, what is it that's going to, to be a factor? And, and, and it's an easy one to say, oh, well, you know, if we... You know, choose a number, choose a number, and uh, we'll keep those teams under that number. Um, it's not so much about uh, getting the right number, but I think over, you know, developing something over time um, where that profile suits your team um, and uh, the, the measure is not necessarily 100% guaranteed. I don't think I've seen in any other season, uh, a stat that uh, is that definitive, 15 and 0, uh, under 80 points. But uh, at least it gives you what happens when you win, 
what happens when you lose, and what happens when you meet the KPI. So if you're meeting the KPI and you're losing, it's not a KPI you should be focusing tremendously on. Um, if we move to that left-hand side of the page, you know, the trends and the indicators, um, who plays well together uh, comes into this, uh, the style of play comes into it, what, what style do you want to play? You know, I suspect if you had to uh, you know, choose some teams that uh, we may watch, uh, I imagine um, the indicators for the Golden State Warriors may be different to the New York Knicks. They, may, they play in the same league. Uh, they're, they're trying to win games, um, but the style in which they play uh, are, are different. So um, you can imagine that if you subbed in Golden State, uh, shooting over 50% would be con you know, fairly consistent uh, as opposed to now and then for the 2017 Rangers. Um, the, the query of why do some lineups struggle? Um, it, it's nothing is a one size fits all. And, um, you know, if you look at some of those statistics in the middle you know, of three point attempts, um, greater than 25 wasn't, uh, you know, didn't end up a, a good result, even though um, this particular team was a good shooting team. The more threes we took, uh, the worse we played. And so sometimes there may be lineups that do better and shoot a better clip, but it can't be for every lineup. It can't be for every player. Um, and this is the, the thing, the, the note at the bottom is that can you devise a plan to maximize or minimize uh, the lineup um, and how they play? Um, how much can you um, affect the game for them? You know, how can you limit you know, some of those lineups and, and what rules can you put in place uh, to make sure that that lineup is playing into its strengths. There are some more stats there, but we won't go through all of them. So the next, um, Next slide here is using data to assist in team selections. Um, over the course of the last four years or so, probably more, um, certainly from a Victorian state uh, metro point of view, uh, and a little bit you know, to do with the you know, junior national team. The use of data for me um, allows a, a different look. It allows a, an extra um, tool to be able to determine in a very short amount of time, you know, what kind of team are you going to be selecting to go and play in a tournament? Um, the difference, I guess, when it comes to uh, the tournament play um, as opposed to a season is that you, know, you don't have, you know, you don't have time and uh, the, the turnarounds uh, are obviously day by day. And how are you going to um, determine whether players are able to um, one uh, perform in a, in a tournament uh, scenario uh, and then um, make sure that, you know, the players, and there's, uh, there's 25 on the list in the table, um, how are you going to get the right 10? And how are you going to get the right 10 that can play together uh, and uh, perform day by day to get a result at the end of that week? So just as a, a summary, the, there were 32-minute games the East Coast Challenge is played in Sydney. Um, there are five games in three days. So two teams of 12. Uh, if you look, player 130 wasn't available um, uh, for that particular tournament. And even though he was selected in the team, you know, that was a, 
a judgment call that uh, had to be made by the coaching staff um, to consider after seeing all of the action, you know, whether that player um, should be selected. Um, the, the groups played against the same teams, you know, so they allowed for direct comparison, um, playing against the same opposition. And the interesting part is that with all of this, um, when it comes to this data, it's not, it's not the be all and end all, and it shouldn't be. Uh, anything that you use to um, you know, make your uh, judgments or um, you know, rate performance, um, this should be a combination of things. And certainly when it comes to you know, selection of teams, if you look and you've obviously got players in, in positions um, in the table, we've got to make sure that not only are the players effective, which um, points to some things uh, in the impact, um, impact that the player has on the games, um, but they also have to, you know, have team balance, have some, you know, players need some leadership qualities. They've got to be able to perform under pressure. Um, and if, if you, you know, have a look over to the right-hand side um, in the point guard battle, I suppose, um, the, the top guy in the point guard battle uh, in terms of selection uh, was the highest impact guy in that position. But it didn't happen like that throughout the positions. Um, you know, in the two guard spot, you know, player seventy one, highest impact. Uh, he was selected as an emergency uh, when all of the, the factors were were put into play. Um, just because you know, over that five game period, he was the highest impact guy. Uh, we certainly carefully um, considered him for the team um, but you know, as you know that final paragraph says we've got skill sets um, you know ability to perform and then also you've got to consider you know the players and, and you know the specific skill sets that they bring to the team and the team balance you know player 130 was uh, had significant defensive abilities. Um, and so when we looked through those positions, we looked for the impact, but then we also looked for um, what type of impact. And we, we, in all of our positions, we didn't feel like we should pick similar players. So that if you're in the point guard spot, we shouldn't have you know, player 45 who plays exactly like player 66. We wanted, we wanted uh, some organization with the point guards. We wanted some, um, some scoring ability and that not, it didn't necessarily come from the same guy. So whilst we're, we're checking for the impact, making sure we're talking about the right guys for selection, uh, we then tried to match, uh, match all of the skills that we felt like we needed to go away to try to win the national championship. Um, when all of this information, you know, sits side by side, it, it at least allows you to um, consider all the players, uh, not only from video, not only from watching, you know, with your own eyes, uh, considering the style, style of play that you want to uh, go to the tournament with, um, but we felt that this gave us um, a comprehensive view of those players. Um, and uh, it is proven uh, to be successful. Uh, in the, the teams that we selected uh, you know, were able to perform and perform very well. Now, the, the use of data, you know, I, and it's certainly by no means, uh, you know, trying to 
figure out um, you know, how the Perth Wildcats beat the Sydney Kings. But I had a, you know, used the tool that Mike Funky and I um, use consistently to have a look at the substitution profile of the Sydney Kings in that third game of the NBL final series. Now, if you have a look at this graphic, this is a different look uh, at all of those lineups that we saw on the first page. And if you have a look at how many lineups the Sydney Kings put on the floor, uh, quite a few. And, you know, the, you look at, you know, obviously the top lineup was the starting lineup. And when you look at that, you, you think, okay, I watched the basketball game. It was played for 40 minutes and uh, it was a pretty entertaining game. I thought, uh, you know, the Wildcats got off to a good start, clearly with that, you know, plus eight. There's a minus eight for the starting lineup for Sydney. Uh, and then, you know, Sydney were forced into a catch-up game. Now, you know, if you look at that graphic, uh, it was the third quarter where Sydney got their their best impact. Their, their, their lineup that had the, the highest impact was middle of that third quarter. And if you have a look here, a plus six in 44 seconds. Now, you think, right, well, and this is why you... I feel it's interesting to have a look at this. They got a plus six here. They had a, a plus seven in the fourth quarter. All right, plus six and a plus seven. Um, but if you look at this plus six, it, it only got played once for less than a minute, and it was a it was a positive lineup. The lineup above that had a plus seven didn't do so well in the second quarter and played a similar amount of time. 44 seconds, well, that was a part of a run uh, where Kevin Lynch hit back-to-back -back threes and tied the game at 63. Um, coaches would say, I would, you know, I would say, gee, you know, should, should that lineup have played a little more? Well, I'm not about to second-guess uh, coach of the Sydney Kings at all. Um, but it, if you don't see the information in this manner um yeah certainly there was no right of reply you know, everything shut down after game three so there was no adjustments that could be made um but does that did that profile was that an anomaly you know had it happened before could that lineup have played more um you know we'll never know now because the series was finished but that's the kind of profile that uh, I like to see after games to to see how and and all of this is how I as the coach have managed my players and because all of this impact data uh, is purely the coach's decision making I, you know, I the coach of the Sydney Kings start this lineup I decide to make a change I decide to make another change um, along with some you know, strategy changes and some um, you know, changes of offense and defense and you know, change uh, matchups and, and all sorts of things go along with it. Um, but it's always really interesting to see um, what m me, how I, as the coach, have run the, the game. What were, what were my decisions? You know, how, did I miss something? Uh, was I able to, um, you know, respond to a negative run? Did I maximize um, my positive run properly? Um, and could I have done things differently? And that's the kind of uh, thing for me when I'm evaluating myself. Uh, it's, it's a true reflection of, of the decisions I've made during the game as coach. Sometimes they're difficult to read. Um, you know, having considered this type of information for the last probably 10 years, 
um, and knowing that part of what I'm trying to do is put lineups on the floor to have a positive impact on the scoreboard, I still don't get this right. And, um, you know, sometimes I'm able to correct, you know, uh, what's happening in the game and, and sometimes I leave it too long. And um, when you look at the lineups like this, sometimes it's hard to decipher. So that's why I like to have a look at the individual's you know, totals as well while I'm looking at the lineups. Did I shortchange, uh, you know, any of my players? Did I overplay some of my players? Um, sometimes the most difficult thing to do is, is um, you know, play your better, arguably, better players or starters, uh, shorter minutes on any one um, game night because somebody who's coming off your bench is having a game. Um, um, we're able to uh, track this, during, Mike and I are able to track this during the games um, and it's not uh, for reference to validate any of the decisions we're making. We sometimes just want to avoid a group that's not playing well. Um, and as you can see here, you know, when you look at the starters played a total of uh, seven minutes and eight seconds together in game three of a grand final, uh, there are a significant amount of game minutes where there are a lot of other combinations on the floor. So the decisions and, um, and the assessments for this type of profile certainly reminds me as a coach that if I am at training, I should not just play the starters together against the bench players all the time. Because it seems, and certainly this profile uh, reflects, they don't play together that often. So what, what are you trying to do with this information? Uh, you know, for me, I'm trying to play the starters together, sure. Can I get a second lineup that sits in the positive third lineup, fourth lineup? And can I minimize lineups that hit the floor that lose uh, uh, scoreboard pressure or, or are negative in those impacts? Um, and the more often I can build lineups to be positive, um, you are now going deeper and deeper into your rotation uh, to you know, continue to be uh, effective on the court. When you're able to do that, you can shorten the minutes of the starters. Um, and if you can shorten the minutes of the starters and in increase the minutes of the guys off the bench, immediately you're able to play at a higher tempo. Uh, so if you have to slow the tempo for the starters, um, it better be because they are very, very good half court uh, um, players and they're able to execute very well. You might go a slower half court type of style with a group, but then if the group plays better in a higher tempo, then surely that would be part of your strategy and decision making um, when you put that lineup on the floor. And for me, having tables like this and data like this that is collected consistently starts to give me that profile, starts to give me the profile of what I can do with those lineups. Can they rebound? Can they pressure? Um, you know, if they, if they can't, you know, shoot, we better, you know, call certain sets or have play structures that, you know, open up the floor and allow driving lanes. All of those things come out of what this data uh, is able to tell you. Now, we, we were talking about um, the feet in the paint and this table here shows you a um, uh, summary of how you know, the emus did at the World Cup uh, on possessions where we were able to get our feet in the paint. 
and when we were not able to. Um, we played Canada on day one. It was a single figure loss. And you can see the difference between the success rates of when we're in and when we don't get in. Um, significantly better once we get our feet in the paint. You know, Latvia was the next day. Uh, we, we played better, it was a double digit win. Um, and we improved a little bit on, uh, certainly on our uh, feet in the paint and we limited our uh, attacks when we didn't. Uh, Mali was a, a single digit win on day three. Um, you know, as you can see, 30 field goal attempts without getting our feet in the paint. Uh, they were a pretty big team, pretty athletic, um, and and managed to keep us out of there. Um, but, you know, fortunately, we were able to win the game. Uh, the key game uh, was the round of 16 game against Lithuania, and we lost that game, double-digit loss, and that put us into the um, bottom half of the draw after that. Um, you know, if you have a look at you know, the key thing that I certainly noticed was you know, 35 field goal attempts, you know, without getting our feet in the paint. And um, it was a credit a little bit to their defense. Uh, they certainly disrupted us um, and um, forced us into lower percentage play. Uh, and that uh, was our undoing in the end. Obviously, the last three games, uh, we, we improved uh, and played better in that space. Um, but the damage it was done at that tournament and we couldn't get that one back. Um, so uh, that's just a, a snapshot of, of the effectiveness of play. Can you get in the paint? If you can, you're going to shoot a higher percentage. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a two-point field goal, but certainly if you get in, it's either a two or a kick-out three, and the shooting percentage was significantly better. So in summary... Have your clear game strategy and scouting plan. Educate players on the why that's got to do with if you have your KPIs, if you have your goals, what, is it, what does it mean? Why do they need to do it? And what, you know, how does it impact the result? And certainly have it for your own team and uh, try to limit your opponent. Um, and then also re recognize and respond to the game within the game. You know, know your lineups that are effective in all types of situations. If you can, customize your game plan for each of your lineups on offense and defense. Sometimes you've got to tweak the rules for different lineups to suit. Uh, and then also the last thing, you know, manage your rotations to maximize advantage and minimize disadvantage. Um, I hope some of what I talked about tonight um, you found interesting. Um, and again, thanks, Reese, for the opportunity to present a little bit of this uh, over uh, these online sessions. And thanks. Thanks for that, uh, DP. That was awesome. Um, some some great detail there for the coaches to sort of see how you approach it and how you attack it, and um, that it influences your decision making. But I think the thing, um, particularly like when you spoke about selections um, and I sort of learned this from from you when um, I was coaching the, the female states team was um, just you know bringing it back to factual things avoiding those opinionated debates around players it, it gave you factual information that you could um, you know really make sure that those uh, opinions were, were based on things that were, were true um, and that and just helped with that so I um, definitely think that that was uh, is important in selection to have as as many facts as possible, which is sometimes hard in those tournaments, but just trying to find a way, like you said, it doesn't have to be an official speed of stats bench that are taking those stats. It can be someone on their iPad or, you know, I know you guys sat there on your computers punching stuff in. So I think that, um, yeah, there's definitely ways around it. There's a bunch of questions, mate. I'll try and work through um, some of them. Uh, Absolutely. So just, just for a couple of the coaches, clarify, when you say, um, when you calculate impact, are you talking about plus minus? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. As simple as that is. Yep. So so that answers that question a couple of people asked. So the impact yep. is plus minus. 
um, so essentially the score when they're on the court. And they're well, that's right. I mean, uh, they come onto the floor. Um, you know, the score is what it is. If, uh, if the, the advantage is, is improved, it's stretched, it's positive. If, uh, if you lose your advantage and you lose the lead or you, you lose your margin, uh, it's a negative. Yep, perfect. Perfect. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, so let me scroll back up. Um, how much of that info are you sharing with players or teams? So a couple of people asked around individually um, with players, are you going through their stuff, but also as a team, how much info are you sharing with the team and how much value um, are they seeing from that, from that extra value? Uh, for that extra information? I tend, yeah, I tend to, um, I tend to not show them the impact um, it depends. It depends on the player. I think sometimes if, uh, if you have got a mature player um, and you're able to say, hey, listen, uh, I know you scored your 24 points and your 12 rebounds, um, but you were minus eight and we, were, we won the game. Uh, so while you're getting your statistics, the end result for us as a group isn't positive. So I definitely would share that information for the mature player for younger players uh you know you're always not trying to sugarcoat the world for them but i think sometimes uh those things can be a hard hit uh if uh, they're showing up negative in their play um but at times uh depending on how you're tracking as a team i think it's good to show some of that information, not deliberate, not, not spend too much time on it, um, but at least show a snapshot and, and definitely the team goals. Uh, they definitely will know those goals uh, and be able to tell me what they are. If they, if they can't tell me what the goals are, they're not really goals. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you either, either live them or, uh, you know, you may as well push them to the side. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, when you're tracking that lineup data for yourself, are you predominantly looking at it post game or do you try and get some of that in game from your assistant coaches? Um, uh, both. Um, the in game stuff um, is, is it's, it's mainly if, uh, just to bounce it off me to make sure I, I'm recognizing it. Yeah. Um, I think uh, there are times when, you know, uh, my assistant coaches will come up and I, I know that they're, they're tracking towards me to say, hey, can you get that lineup off the court? Because they're not very good against the zone. Yeah. Right? And, and we know that, but, you know, as we all are, not that well, coach, coach knows all, but sometimes, you know, we're, we're testing. We're testing it out a little longer than, than those who are sitting in front of the data. And then uh, most, most of the time I'm, yep, okay. Let's go. Let's choose the right lineup for the style of play that's being played in the game. Yeah. So this is more from me, but how defined are your assistant coach roles then um, related to both the data, but just in general, uh, more, more holistically, how defined are you uh, in game with those coaches roles? Yeah, we, um, they're defined. Uh, one, one is tracking that information. Um, uh, one is, uh, tracking the success rates of all of our uh, set plays, uh, which I didn't show in this particular um, session, but um, you know we have a list of you know all of our play sets and and the success rates of those on any one night um, you know, is tracked so that uh, you know perhaps if we're looking for a basket in the fourth quarter. Um, we can have a quick glance at what's been effective in that particular game and, and go to it. Uh, there's so many times where, um, you know, we get to the end of the game and say, hey, we were pretty good. We went five scores out of five in the Eagle. Uh, why didn't I run the Eagle more than that, uh, you know, to if it's such a successful play? But, um, but we also do that. And then there's also uh, you know, usually another uh, assistant looking at some of those defensive um, measures. Yeah, awesome. Um, how do you collect the data um, is a question. So, I mean, obviously, sometimes it'll be feed, your feed the stats. Um, yeah. Um, how, so how else do you work around it? Yeah. Uh, look, you know, it, just by hand, handwritten, uh, yeah. if we don't have the luxury of that information. Um, yeah, I didn't show, you know, uh, there are all sorts of um, things that Mike and I have worked on. And there is one where... 
um, you know, we're able to see the data, um, look at the impacts, but then also know what the box score was for that lineup uh, while they're on the floor in, in all categories and um, the, what the box score was against them in all categories so that it allows us to see, you know, boy, this, this crew can't rebound or this crew was, um, you know, taking too many three-point shots. Um, it doesn't solve it on the spot but it gives us information to, to look back at the video to see what was happening to then uh, plan for it in the next game. Sure. It's fair to say if you're one of your assistant coaches, you better be pretty switched on during the game, right? <laughs> um, I, like, I like everybody to know what's going on. Yeah. Um, you had one of the uh, KPIs in your team goals was 25-plus um, foul shots. Um, mm -hmm. What would be some of the suggestions to, to sort of try and get that, um, to make sure you're sort of hitting that target? Are you talking to them about attacking the basket harder, getting feet in the paint, post catches? What sort of some of the things you're doing there? Yeah, it's a, it horses for courses, depending on who you're playing. But, um, you know, it's easy to say, hey, let's just uh, pound the ball inside and that'll, that'll just make, uh, that'll get us free throws. Um, if they're a bigger team than you, you've got to get their bigs out of the paint um, and drag them out into some screening actions. If, uh, um, you know, a lot of the time, some of my, uh, the best options to get to the free throw line are slashing from wings and flashing from weak side, you know, uh, catches and um, not what you would probably normally uh, attribute to, oh, well, I'll just do this and, and that'll get me to the free throw line. I think uh, what we found, especially last year uh, when we went to the Worlds, it was hard to get to the free throw line. You know, yep. the, 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 there's a lot of uh, contact um, that yep. needs to be managed. And, um, you know, we didn't do a good job of getting to that free throw line. But um, beating teams down the floor will help you get to the line. Um, and that's not necessarily dribbling. It's, uh, you know, lane running and, and getting kicker heads. Um, certainly, you know, getting that ball into um, post targets. Um, but also uh, backing yourself, and this is players, to make passes to cutters going to the rim. Um, you know, I think uh, if there's anything that um, you know, prevents you from getting to the line, I, I think it's the, it's the, the skill of passing um, that uh, you know, we, we identified that we needed to be better passers um, you know, when we go and play internationally uh, because the, all teams are very good at def defending on ball screens, um, you know, away screens to free up you know, small to big you know, screens, uh, anything that creates mismatch. Cool. Perfect, mate. Um, there's, there's too many questions, to be honest, to get through. I'll just try and get through. <laughs> That's one okay, question. mate. Yeah. They'll have to uh, follow up afterwards. To be honest. Yeah, sure. They're going to no go worries. forever. Um, so there was one more I had sort of penciled to go with. Um, oh, um, do you use effective field goal percentage much in your sort of uh, analysis? Or yeah. Um, we, look, we look at it all. Um, yeah. I, I haven't uh, landed on effective field goal percentage as a, as a tool that I use, but I'm all, always interested in it. I'm yeah. always interested in uh, um, efficiencies and, um, you know, points per possessions. And yeah. uh, there are lots of, lots of stats that I think, uh, like I've sort of said in this session, that sit with, you know, the, the stuff that we've talked about uh, tonight, um, because they are also, pretty factual measures of, of, uh, of how your team is playing and how effective it, it is and your players. No, awesome, awesome. Well, uh, DP, that was, that was great. The detail, uh, your willingness to share um, a bit of what you do was uh, really appreciated. And obviously you can tell just from the amount of questions coming in that um, the coaches are engaged with it. So thank you so much for that. Pleasure and thanks for having me. No worries. Um, we will now uh, move into the, the second presentation with uh, Coach David Herbert. Um, obviously, Herbie, current under-19 women's head coach uh, for Australia, uh, but very experienced at WNBL level, um, having coached in Townsville in West Coast, along with some uh, other roles as well. Um, I was most recently the NBL one women's coach at Geelong uh, and currently the Basketball Victoria hub 
high performance coach for Geelong as well. So um, extensive career. There's a lot of other things as well. But um, Herbie's going to present on coming out of isolation, a better shooter. So I'll pass over to you, coach. No worries. I'll try and work out this technology. Hang on. Same thing as uh, Darren here. <laughs> I'm just, uh, I share Beautiful. my screen. It's, it's coming, mate. Beautiful. That's working? Yep. Okay. All right. What I, what I did, I, I put together um, my, my thoughts on shooting. Um, obviously, I love, the, love teaching shooting. It's something that's very dear to my heart. And uh, I've spent a lot of time with a number of great shooters, uh, which uh, in, include, like, I actually won't say names. It's, there's a lot of Australian players, a lot of young players coming through. Uh, I was lucky. I was involved with the Vic Country program at a very strong time. So... Uh, as you can see, I've tried to highlight Australian shooters more than anything. So I've actually done it as a video. I've done it at 0.75 speed. So hopefully no glitches. And uh, we'll, I'm just going to work through I'll stop it. Um, I'll probably refer to uh, my, my actual uh, camera at times and just do a couple little exercises and things like that. So um, Chris Goulding, obviously terrific shooter for Australia. Um, the... The, the slides are uh, probably going to go even slower. I did, I did a test run, but uh, as I said, the, um, so this is the, so one of, one of the quotes that, that I like, I'll just try and shift this across a bit more so you can see it. Um, practice shooting eight hours a day, but if your technique's wrong, then all you do is become good at, at uh, shooting the wrong way. So what, I, what I'm saying to that is right now, is a perfect chance to reset, uh, work with kids online or wherever you, where, wherever you can and actually correct their, their shooting. Uh, I think in Australia, it's something that uh, we neglect and we don't spend enough time on technique, but now is a perfect time. Uh, uh, someone said to me, when, when do you correct a technique or when, when don't you? Uh, I say, correct it regardless. Um, because once a player has a good eye and they're making a lot of shots, little adjustments won't matter. Um, and again, I'm speaking about my philosophy here. So uh, as, we, as we work through these slides, so uh, this, is, this is one thing I brought into uh, Geelong and our hub this year. So we call it a shooting license. Um, and we, I ask, can you achieve the following? Can you shoot 10 in a row from two feet away? Can you shoot 10 free throws in a row? Can you make 13 of 15 mid-range shots? Can you make 10 of 13 from the three-point line? And uh, I, I can tell you not many kids can do that across Australia. So I did have one kid in my hub who did it on his first attempt. Um, I, I won't say that it annoyed me. I thought it was terrific. But at the same time, I thought that's, that's, that's pretty damn good. And by doing that, this, this same kid had uh, six or seven threes, I think, in the the final of the under-16 boys at Albury this year. So he's well on track uh, to, to doing the work and becoming a great shooter. Uh, Alison Cook, uh, obviously one of Australia's best. Um, Tranquilly now. So uh, another tremendous shooter. I'm, I'm going to work through various little techniques and things shortly. And uh, so a couple of, couple of th key things. Obviously, there's, there's a fantastic shooter. Um, absolutely perfect action, perfect style. And I'll go through a number of those things uh, as we go. Um, so be willing to practice every day. Uh, perfect your technique and your form. I'm just going to fiddle around. I'll get this screen up. That, that might be... Uh, how do I reduce this? I'll try and... No. Are you trying to get rid of the screens on the side, Herbie? Like the yeah, you're yeah, just, just going to minimize it down. You should be able to go to that the smallest one, and that'll get yeah. them out there for you. That was a little bit small. Sorry, there we go. Okay, so perfect your form and technique. Try something new, and develop you. Be your own best coach. What I what I mean by that is, uh, take in the best points of every coach, or players take in the best points of every coach, and then develop and become their own best coach. I think it's really really important. Um, like everyone's different. Uh, every every player has. I had a had a girl that couldn't straighten up her wrist. It used to basically bend around on an angle like that. So instead of having her, well, she was right handed. Instead of having her right foot forward, I changed and went with her left foot forward. So understand that every player, every kid is different. There's no right or wrong for each kid, and 
I, I might go through 20, 25 points tonight, and I would never, ever throw 20, 25 points at a kid. I'd throw one or two maximum in a session. Um, what works for some shooters doesn't work for others. Um, and I had a, I've got a slide with a photo. I, I won't say his name, but I, I had a large influence on my, what I learned. Um, I've got a slide with him on there. And uh, it's, it's one of, probably one of Australia's best shooters outside of Andrew Gaze. And uh, it's interesting. I run a lot of coaching courses for Rob Coulter. Uh, I bring the guy's name up and hardly anyone knows him. So um, over my time, I, I, I learn an eye for detail. So I can walk on a floor and go bang, bang, bang. That, that's what I think you're doing wrong. And sometimes I'm not exactly right. But, uh, I, and shooting is like that. But um, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get through uh, to everyone tonight, I've simplified. While I've got a lot of points, I've still simplified everything to hopefully make sense. Uh, I'm, <clears throat> I'll just keep this rolling along. The, uh, I understand shooters aren't made, it's a lot of hard work. So developing a, a form that's consistent uh, takes a lot of repetitions in practice. In correct practice, you master the skill. So developing rhythm, touch, timing. Uh, it's not learn overnight, it's practice. This, uh, the, I, I must have timed this slide. I, I like, that, uh, like that picture. So everyone's different. Develop your own philosophy on shooting. And I'm pleased to share mine tonight with you. So uh, David Anderson, another, like that, that form looks pretty good. That left hand's turning a little bit, but uh, everyone has their own little quirks. Um, and, but what you're trying to do is, is get to a point where the ball shot straight. This is a guy I was talking about on the right. Um, if, you wanna, if you wanna actually put in the notes right now, if you can guess who that is, I won't say his name. Um, put, just, just write in the chat thing there, just uh, let Reese know. Uh, first answer, I think, uh, Reese, you're offering a car, aren't you, for win from Winter Basketball? Is that right? Or not quite, not quite. Okay, there's uh, a few coming in though. A quote, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie Palavinskis. There we go. Beautiful. The best shooters shoot exactly the same way every time they look at the basket. Okay, so Steph Curry, he's rotating his shoulders. He's doing a few things funky, but that that follow through straight. Some common acronyms: beef, balance, eyes. Elbow, follow through, follow through, feel, finger, eye, elbow, lock. Whatever you come up with, okay, be, sell it as best you possibly can because that's what I'm going to try and do uh, with you, with everyone very shortly. Uh, obviously, there's Chris, another photo of Chris Goulding. Um, okay, the... Uh, the other one, like the, the, the old one, put your hand in the cookie jar. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Preparation. So prepare to shoot the ball before you receive the ball. So visualize the ball being received, stepping into your shot, be low and ready, feet shoulder width apart, hands ready, wrist back, all those key things uh, to, to be ready to go. Be ready to catch the ball in the air. Um, there's Trish Fallon. I might get copyright on that. I didn't notice that it had uh, Getty images on it. So, um, but uh, another terrific player. We're going to get into the, the more specific points right now. So load. Uh, when, when you're loading the ball up, this is where you're generating power. So we want to lock your feet and head into your shot. So what I, what I mean by that is actually I'm going to, there are a couple of little video clips uh, that I use with, uh, my my uh, partner or my son um, Levi coming up that uh, I, I put into the video, but you want to generate power from the legs, get the ball to the shooting po pocket, and a big one for me is developing those shooting lines. So here, this is just a little example here. Hopefully, it's not glitchy of the load position. So what Levi's done there, okay? He's caught the ball in the air. He's actually caught it in a stride stop. And nothing wrong with that. That, that's, that is actually my preference. Uh, some players prefer a jump stop. But uh, what he's done here, generally, if you can see my cursor, the shoulders are square, the feet are square, 10 toes pointing to the ring. Uh, and what we talk about in a moment is some, some shooting lines. So first shooting line, your feet. Second one, your shoulders. Same view from behind. So shooting lines, feet apart. That, that left shoulder dips a little bit, something that uh, he needs to work out a little bit, puts his shot off at times. Uh, ball's in the shot pocket, 
And this is dependent on age. As you, when you're younger, obviously you would bring the ball lower. As you get older, you start to bring it towards your eye and then, then you may even bring it higher from there. Side view, again, oh, that went a little bit fast. Sorry, I'll go back. The second one, again here, so side view. She's catching the ball. All the power is generated through the legs here. The back is straight, head over your feet. His feet and head are locked in, which is a, a really key point that uh, I, I talk about. It's something that Tom Maher said, uh, one of Australia's best coaches ever. Uh, he said to me, that was, uh, that was, that was key. Uh, lock your feet and head into your shot. Everything's nice and balanced. So again, head over your feet, uh, feet square, shoulders square. Um, and we'll, we'll get into more detail about the lines uh, in a moment. So as we go through the next slide, so load. In, this is part, still part of the load position. So when I talk about load, what I'm actually saying, all of this represents load. So it's, a, it's something that represents this whole picture here. So when I talk about shooting, I say load, lift, lock, and snap. And this is the first part of it here. So what I'm talking about here, obviously Paddy Mills, um, the line of vision. So first thing I talk about it, you, what you see is what you shoot to. I, I see kids and I, I work with uh, Sarah Blixavs, perfect example. I, I met her for the first time. I'm doing a, a session with her, five minutes into the session, turned around and said, what the hell are you doing? Um, she was actually bringing, if you see my video at the top there, the ball was coming, hand was coming back behind her head and she's releasing the ball. All of a sudden the ball was out of her line of vision. She basically lost full control over what she was doing. She couldn't see it. All we did was bring that from there to the front of her eye. Uh, she went from, uh, and I'm not saying it's me. What I am saying is that line of vision, she shot through that line of vision, through that line of vision, kept the hands in front of her, and it made an enormous difference to her shot technique. For it, she went from not hitting a three to making threes. It was something that worked for her. Uh, the index finger, that's a, that's a really important one. Uh, that's the last finger to touch the ball. So. Again, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail as we go through. Fine muscle control. Um, again, I'll, I'll talk about that and some shooting lines, which we're getting to. Some people talk about two fingers, the, the middle finger, et cetera. Um, and I'll speak about that in a moment. So shooting lines. So what I'm talking about here, I, I'll use the video here. And again, you'll see it on the screen. From the thumb to the pinky, from the thumb to the pinky, should be a straight line. That's not an ideal photo there, but uh, it's the only one I had. Um, but you, what you want to try and do is create a line from your thumb to your pinky and your index finger down the middle forming a triangle. So when you, when you actually hold the ball, the ball becomes centered. It stays off the base of the palm. It does touch part of the base up on the, up on the pads of your palm and the pads of your fingers. What I, what I want you to do is look at my video screen and just do this for me. Put your the fingernail in front of your dominant eye and hold your elbow out as wide as you possibly can, like I have there, if you can see that. What I want you to do is just turn, keep that fingernail in front, turn your hand around, and basically find where your thumb and your pinky are straight across and the index finger is still in front of your right eye. I was always told, when I was shooting as a kid, get your elbow directly underneath the ball. What that does, I lose the line of my, my thumb and my pinky. So what I want to do is be in a situation where I'm just getting my elbow to a point that that's straight. So what I've done is create a line and a line to the ring. My elbow isn't directly underneath the ball, but I've got the ball centered because of it. So that's, that's one of the, the, the key things to me is, and I tell kids to put the index finger on the valve. So as they, as they actually load the ball, the, I get them to put their finger on the valve, lift it up, and off we go. Why, why I say that is from the thumb to the pinky is a closer distance than from the index finger to the pinky. So if I went to the middle, it's a, it's a lot greater distance from the middle to the thumb than the middle to the pinky. So that's why the index finger 
is the mo is is basically centering the ball in your hand. So again, this this was influenced by uh, Eddie Pelabinskis, who we saw earlier. Uh, he he, uh, I, I got to spend three or four days with him at the AS one one time, and uh, this is basically a lot of what a lot of what he taught me. Um, I've, I've continued on that practice. So we continue on with the video now. So the next one will be obviously uh, looking the other way on the hand eventually. Yep, right there. So again, you've got that you've got that balance of the ball being centered um, and that those lines created. Because if you if you if you've got an angle like this or an angle like that, the ball's obviously going to change. And I say the, the the ball off the base of the palm. I, I saw a, a uh, something on Facebook the other day saying the ball should be on your palm and um, I don't agree with that. I think it's um, definitely should be up off the palm, up but on the pads of the, the palm. So the upper pads of the palm and the pads of the fingers. The L shape of the, the, uh, the elbow there, but doesn't have to be directly underneath the ball. I stress that point again. And what I, the lift of the shot, so we, we're talking about uh, actually lifting the ball. So power out of the floorboards. I'll just go back on that one just a second. So we want to get power out of the floor. We want to lift our hips quick and release at the top of our jump. At, at the top where you've got maximum power is where you want to shoot the ball. You want to maintain those lines. So going back to the lines and simplifying it now. Feet straight, 10 toes to the ring, shoulders straight. Two glasses of water on either shoulder shouldn't spill any. Your your hands, your thumb to your your thumb to your pinky and the index finger. Those lines are are there. So we're we're now we we're generating power. One of the common problems when you're when you're lifting for a shot. Just for two seconds, to go back. One of the problem, common problems is players lift and arch their back. What I'm saying is. When you lift and arch, lift lift early and arch your back, you lose all the power from your legs. So your shoulders end up doing the work. Um, it's fine when you become an experienced elite athlete. You don't need that anymore. But as a younger player, you want to teach correct form and basically get all the power from the legs, uh, get all the power out of the floor that you can by lifting those hips quick. Okay, question, what do I aim for? Um, there's, there's some people aim simply for the ring. Some aim for the bolt or the spring on the ring. Some people say a foot out, a foot up. Um, no right or wrong again. Uh, young, or not young anymore, it was when I coached her, but Kelly Wilson, uh, prestigious career uh, in the WNBL. She couldn't see the ring, it was a blur. Um, the, the thing that she just aimed for, aimed for the basket. And, it's interesting, I asked kids online the other day what, they're, what they aim for when they shoot. And so many different answers. It, it, uh, but there was a common thing is, is just aim for the center of the rim. And uh, again, when I was playing, um, maybe that's why I wasn't successful, but I, I shot it, I aim for the center of the rim. So um, there's, there's ways and you will develop your philosophy on that uh, due to past experience. So the lock and snap. So as you're lifting, you're locking and snapping. Belinda Snell there on the, on the left. Uh, what I'm talking about here is those lines again. So when I shoot the ball, and Eddie Pelabinskis talks about fine muscle control. Uh, obviously, you can't see. I have no muscle in my arm anymore. I need to get in the gym. But as I shoot the ball and I snap my wrist, what I, if, I, if I lower my fingers, what I'm doing is actually using additional muscles that I don't need. Some people say, put your hand in the cookie jar. You're actually using muscles you don't need. Eddie Pelabinski just talks about the lines. So from here, keeping that line from your thumb to your pinky and the index finger at the rim and putting a lid on the rim. Um, and I, I, it's something that um, at an older age, I worked at my free throws after hearing that. I agree, I think it's a, a, it's a great tip. So um, again, that little triangle is representative of how you want your kids to finish their shot. Jazz Shelley, uh, a player I was fortunate to work with last year, as she does this, she actually, she drops that index finger down and she shoots. So she, it, it definitely makes that, the ball come off that index finger, which was something, something interesting and, and it worked for her, which was good. And 
it followed in the same philosophy, keeping that line straight, etc. Okay, we go on again. Fingers spread, find muscle control. So just get that's the easiest way to make sure that there is fine muscle control in your shot just by doing the same thing every time. If I go like that, how much does each finger bend? I can go like that and I can do the same thing every time. So consistency, rhythm, etc., is really important. So what, I, what we talk about is looking through the window, have a clear view. And I'll show a video of that in a minute. Go back. So as I shoot the ball, I want to see through the window of my shot. So that index finger stays in line, but I'm able to see and I've got vision to, uh, to continue. The index finger, the line of vision, the guide hand, guide hand stays on the side of the ball. It doesn't move or put any pressure on the ball at all. It just stabilizes it. So as I shoot, I push through and continue. Again, I talked about those shooting lines, feet, shoulders, hands. It's, it's all important. So now we're going to look at some, some drills. And this is the, the chunky part of the, uh, or the good part of the, hopefully, the, of the presentation here. I, I set up a ring outside. I uh, got some, uh, some gray plastic um, squares to put on the floor and uh, basically designed some, some drills that uh, I think um, you could do this without a ring. You don't need a ring. Um, you, you can shoot at a bin. You can shoot, that's the beauty of basketball. You can do whatever you want. You put a, a mark on the floor and shoot at the mark on the floor. But take time to, to basically learn uh, the correct form. So just going to work through a few of these drills. Sorry, I've just had my email pop up here. How do I get it? Just trying to. Sorry, <laughs> I can't reset. Do I? Uh, where are we? I want to move? That's there. We go. Sorry, there we go. Okay. Everyone was reading your emails just then to say no, Herbie. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I do apologize for that. So that's my old email. So there's not much on there. But um, the, uh, this, this, is, this is one thing David Love did at a, uh, a session in Melbourne. And this is about the a backspin check. So using one finger on the ball, taking all your other fingers off and basically just pushing through um, and, and, and looking at the backspin that you generate on your shot. Another drill for backspin. Okay, so if your player isn't generating backspin, he's lying on the floor. So we'll just watch that one again, or watch these two again. So, so these are just little drills that, that uh, you can do with kids to break down their shot. So again here, again, it, it said sl it's at uh, 0.75. Obviously, Levi lifts his eyes a little bit there, but. The, the backspin he generated just off that one finger is tremendous. So again, lying on the ground. Again, by lying on the ground, you're actually, you're, you're generating the backspin that you need. You're, you're getting the ball off your fingertips. It's just a natural thing that happens. The other, the other areas are on your knees, on a chair, um, really important um, in terms of just learning the fundamentals of shooting. What you want to do is look at the shooting lines again. Are the hands square? Is the ball on there? on the valve initially. So one hand shot check, so here. What we wanna do is, again, lock feet and head in. We want the ball in, in good position. So we're making sure it's centered. The elbow won't be directly underneath the ball. It'll, the hand, the thumb and the pinky will be right. The index finger down the middle of the ball and just pushing and following through. You can see there, Levi's working it. He wrapped his fingers then, which he shouldn't have, but uh, I'll give him a suicide tomorrow for that. But um, here, basically, you see that hand finish, fingers spread. Uh, it's a nice follow through on the shot. He's not arching his back. He's keeping your head over his feet, which is maximizing the power. A two-handed one there. Again, another drill. You're working on form and technique. So again, that low position is through the he, Levi's obviously left-handed. It's through that line of vision, the ball centered in his hand, the elbow slightly out a little bit, the shoulders are square, feet are square, the shooting lines are good, there's a lock and snap. And uh, 
generally successful, just has to practice a little bit more. I don't know whether um, you're finding that with kids at the moment, whether they're unmotivated or what. It seems to have got to that point where they're making a decision either way here at the moment with coronavirus. So. Okay, this is just a drill here. Finishing school, taking the ball out of the net without it bouncing, like it happened there. Taking it out of the net, just one step to finish each way. So, and what you can do with all these drills is actually put a time limit on it or a score on it and make it competitive for each time that you do it. So again, these are drills, obviously need a basket. Alternate finishes here, so a layup. Then we have a re reverse layup. He's not that slow, actually. It's actually the, the speed of the, uh, so little, little, that was like a runner slash floater. Euro step. And a pro hop at the end. So again, another drill, just to rehearse a number of those things. This is, that's actually my voice going over the top of this. This is my can drill. Um, this is a great drill for finishing. So every kid should work at this. Um, I'll try and talk over the top of my, my drowning out voice there. I didn't think of a, so this is reverse my can. So you're stepping across your body. Your nose is actually facing the diagonal as you do this and your hand closest to the board is actually shooting the ball. And giving the angle on the back wall. Should be facing the diagonal as you make this shot. <laughs> 0.75 speed didn't quite work on that. Um, this is a, there's a YouTube clip um, that I have added here about the mic and drill. It's 12 variations of the drill. It's great to watch. Um, and basically alternate finishes. So same hand, uh, same foot finishes, uh, a variety of things. It is, it is great and uh, part of a, a shooting routine that I think you should develop. So have a look at that when you get the opportunity. Obviously that'll be uh, in the, the links. This, this is one of the, my favorite drills of all time. Um, anyone who's ever played for me has done this before, I'm sure. Uh, basically what you're looking at here is practicing the load point of your shot. So the earlier drills we did were close to the rim. The earlier drills were based on hand position, follow through, uh, load, lift, lock, snap. This is specifically load and getting the ball to the shooting pocket. So what happens here is you toss the ball out three times. So there's one, toss it out again, catch in the air, load. And what you're looking for again, those shooting line with your feet, with the shoulders, with the hands, making sure your head and feet are locked in over your feet. You're not arching your back, not lifting away. And the third one is obviously a shot. This one, bounce drill. So Levi here, um, we didn't actually edit this, believe it or not. Uh, he makes lucky, he got lucky here, made a few shots. But what he does here, he bounces off an imaginary three point line. So an area on the floor, runs, bounces off, Catches the ball in the air, loads, shoots it, finishes again, turns, runs away. Must be the great passing, which looks terrible on the video there. Um, that's, a, that's a really good drill. Another one, three, two, one shooting drill. So lay up worth one, shoot one at mid range, shoot the three. Again, why I, why I did this in the backyard is that's what we've got at the moment. That's what most kids have got right now. There's not opportunity. I had to set that gray matting is uh, basically just being set up on grass. We, we don't have a concrete area or anything like that. We had to do this to, to, uh, to counter this. And this is ways we're trying to improve shooting while the pandemic is actually on. So again, so through there, again, getting lucky, I think on this. So probably roll back a little bit on that but generally the this is uh another drill <laughs> the uh I'll try and turn down the volume you can't hear it um this is a drill uh, also called ghost drill you get plus one for a make minus two for a miss you need a rebounder on this one so this is jay shelley here she gets one for a make there's minus minus two for a miss you need to go to Plus, plus seven or minus seven on this particular drill. So again, if you look at 
it, Jazz is one of the best shooters Australia's had. If you look at, again, her line, and Eddie, when Eddie Pelabinsis talks, he doesn't talk about feet. So I, uh, he talks about the upper body part of the shot. So Jazz is, is a very straight shooter. That index finger goes through her eye and finishes at the rim every time. Um, she has very soft touch. It come, that index finger drops a little. She gets very good touch on the rim. She has a great arc. Her elbow finishes above her eye, which is another real key point when you're teaching shooting. Uh, and that the hands are out in front. I believe she missed that shot because she didn't extend and get the elbow above her eye on that occasion. So it, again, just refining little things with shooters is so important. Uh, and obviously I'm lucky here working with a player like that. There's only little things that you're picking up each time. And this should be last one. Again, that, that uh, follow through needs to end up a little bit higher. Rip drive shooting. So reverse pivot into a throw down. Um, you could do this for a two minute period and count a score. So Levi rebounds his own, chases it out. Again, catch, reverse pivot, throw down. He's trying to be a little bit NBA like there. Um, but, but again, quite good fundamentals there shown. Um, I'd probably recommend just working on the jump shots, uh, those particular areas, but that's another little drill that you can work at. X out layups, popular old drill. So dribbling on your outside hand, coming back, uh, finishing on finishing layups there. Again, you can uh, basically uh, alternate that with different finishes as well. It's a, a great little drill. Same thing here. Just by yourself, X out uh, elbow jumpers. So you can either pivot on your inside foot, outside foot, or throw it, chase it, catch it in the air to finish. Seven of nine shooting, five spots. Again, see how straight that index finger is from Jazz. She twists her body a little bit, where she over rotates just a fraction. They're things that we worked at, but generally, that, that shot is very, very straight. So going back to those shooting lines earlier that I spoke about, that's, that's key. You wanna, you wanna keep those, develop those lines. See at the moment her shoulder's doing a bit too much work, it needs to generate a little bit more power out of the legs. Sorry about my voice, sir, if you can hear that. That's a spooky like a, it's a, so Richmond drill. This is a, this is a favorite, Justin Schuler. Um, put this through big country. Um, basically what happens here is, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty good look there. Um, Levi's actually gripping the ball a little bit with that left hand. It's not ro rolling off his fingertips and just needs to ro rotate a little bit more, but the feet are square, shoulders are generally square um, and the form's pretty good. So if you make two in a row mid range, then you get to move to the three point line. You stay on the three point line until you miss two in a row and then you have to move back into the mid-range area. So make two mid-range, back to the three-point line. So if you miss, miss this second one, he'd have to move back in. But generally, um, that, that, this is a great little drill. Hopefully this, this is the last one, possibly. Great rebounding again. Um, but it, that, that's a fantastic drill for creating consistency. So last one, free throws in a row. So little, little shooting routine, obviously you need a basket. But again, if you look at Jazz's form, see how straight that index, we'll look at that one more time. So here, see if I can pause it right on the, so here, it's through that line of vision, okay? See that, that index finger drops a little bit. Um, the shot is a lovely soft shot. The hands are in front, the elbows above the eye. Um, she's looking through the window. Um, it, it's a pretty solid technique. Uh, so again, if I, if I refer back to, I could probably take that off there now. Where are we? So, do I just, yep, beautiful. 
Okay, so if I go to this gallery. Okay, that that's that's pretty much my presentation there. There's obviously a lot of little points in there uh, for everyone to take in, but again, these are the things that I work at. And what I say again is that it's really important. I wouldn't throw 20, 30 points at a kid when they're shooting. I'd find one or two things and work at that. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good point, Herbie. That's what I was going to say. There's so much in shooting. I think that's probably why um, people are scared to teach it sometimes because it's results-based as well. You know, if a kid misses a shot, then you're a bad coach or something like that. And, um, yeah, so how do you approach that with, um, with the kids you're coaching? You, you're trying to do this... Um, you know, you've got your base philosophy and then just tinkering little bits. So how does that sort of work um, when, you, when you're starting with someone, you know, as you, at a young age? You know, I, I think it's um, like if you're, you're talking about a kid that's aged, uh, even as soon as they pick a ball up, yep. I try to get them their hand position right. So yep. the tee at the thumbs, the, the, the line's right, the ball's centred so they can shoot it. Yep. Um, yep. And I don't care if they miss. Eventually what will happen is uh, by having that correct form, They'll generate the power to shoot it and make the shot um, as they get older. So the more we the more we actually correct that early, I think the better um, and develop good habits from a young age. So yep. a player like like I talk about Sarah Blix has a player like that comes in with with her feet right, shoulders right, but she's she's back here shooting the ball and lose direction of that. That's where I tinker with her straight away and say, hey, just try this. And a player like that, um, I wanted to try it. I wanted to own it. So it's not me saying, I want you to do this. I want her to buy into it and understand, um, hey, does that work? It doesn't work. How does that feel? Um, so the more elite players that you work with, I think that's really key. Yep. How hard are you on um, younger players dipping the ball? So Levi obviously doesn't dip the ball at all, and you would have coached him a, a fair bit on that, I, I would say. Um, so i got a question from a coach. How hard are you on, um, or how much do you emphasize not dipping the ball? I think if like he's he's a fairly strong young man, so um, I I I've got him going to the shooting pocket straight away now. Um, and he, but he was relatively strong from a young age, so uh, if they're not strong, I would encourage dipping the ball and, and basically bring it through so they get rhythm yep. and they get a feel for it. Um, I I do prefer kids to go straight to the shooting pocket as soon as they're ready. And what I say is this: like the you see the athletes, they the the elite players of the game. They jump and lean back and shoot the ball like that. That's great. But they would have learnt the fundamentals first. Yeah. And uh, the, you, you look at the Andrew Gazers, all those types of the pure shooters. Um, we, you, you really want to get those lines right so they are shooting the ball straight. Um, and I go back to that point of feet straight, shoulders square, the, the, these lines right. What way is the ball going to go? Yeah. There's only one way. It's got to go straight. So then you've got to develop power from the legs and the softness from your hands. And, you're basically nearly there. Yep. How, how do you, you, Herbie, obviously you've got a very clear philosophy there um, and very well grounded, but how do you balance um, uh, particularly younger kids that are seeing stuff on, on YouTube and different things around, you know, this is how Steph Curry NBA shooter shoots. He shoots with his feet to the side. He finishes with the OK sign, all those sort of things. How do you sort of work with um, the athletes and encourage them to do those basic things really, really well like you're talking about? Um, I, I think it, it's just getting the buy-in. Okay, try it your way. Now try it my way. Yeah. And generally, I'm pretty. It's pretty successful like that. Like I, you got to love it as a coach when you you actually get someone to change and they switch it. Yeah. Like I think it's one of the. And I, okay, how does that feel? What What was the? And until they can feel it, uh, they're not going to change. So, kid kids sometimes can't get it the the idea. So it's kind of introducing a layer at a time not introducing six, seven layers, but just to, like with Sarah, it was like, okay, move the ball from here to the line of, keep it in front of your face, line of vision and shoot it. Yep. And uh, she did it. She trialed it. It worked. Okay. And it really changed what she, what she did as a shooter. But again, it wasn't me. It was her. She did the work. Uh, she liked it. And um, it, it has worked for her. Yeah, for sure. Um, got another one from a coach. Um, you spoke about you're not too, you're not, trying to force that elbow under the ball. But as the, as the shot comes up, do you want it to come? Should it be straight towards the rim or, or what's your sort of thoughts on that? Because um, a lot of coaches will say that it should be straight when it gets to that high point. Are you sort of more, is it more about the position of those hands? Yeah, what I'm, I'm just keeping that index finger straight. So in the end, it ends up straight. But as, as, you, as you see, because my shoulder's out there, 
um, the elbow ends up straight. It's not in front of my eye, yeah. but it's basically that index finger is kept through that line of vision. So yeah. it all stays straight. Yeah. Um, and that, that was something Eddie Pelabinskis was a bit on, big on. Like he, he's a guy 60 plus. Uh, we, we met him at the AIS for three or four days and gets a halfway, shoots it with his right hand, shoots it with his left hand. He, he was just freakish. Yeah. And um, it's amazing. Like not many people know who he is yet. He led the Olympics at one or two Olympics uh, for Australia. So. Yep. No, awesome, mate. Um, there's a fair few more. I just want to try and get to some of them. Um, in your shooting practice, so in your practice, how much time do you spend on form shooting versus sort of your repetition drills, um, like your seven, seven shooting drills? So what's sort of the, um, the balance for that? I think every individual that I run, they, they've got to make 10 swishes two feet away from the rim. Yep. Uh, there was a guy, I, I, when I was uh, 16, 17, I was training with uh, Gippsland in the, whatever it was called, the CBL or the Siebel or whatever it might have been. Uh, there's a guy, Kelvin Bowers, uh, an import that came out. He used, he, used to, he used to shoot 75 shots before training two feet away. Um, I've watched, I've worked uh, with the Canberra Capitals with Lauren Jackson and Kerry Graff. She, she'd shoot thousands of shots two feet away. So what I, I every, every session I, I do, they've got to make 10 swishes um, two feet away from the rim and work on their form. And I might even start with one hand, depending how, where they're at, um, but definitely one hand shooting, two hand shooting, and, and really concentrate on the fundamentals so the feel is there for the rest of training. Then you can advance them through um, a series of drills. And I'll even take elite players back to lying on their back and basically shooting the ball so they get the feel of the backspin. Yep. Um, and that's what that, that shooting license, I think, is something that um, we developed as a hub and the kids are striving for it. They, they love it. They want to get there and get their license and having the ability to make 10 in a row um, from in close, um, 10 of, 10, what is it, 13 of 15 or 10 free throws, 13 of 15 mid-range and 10 of 13 threes. If they do that, they're, they're, they're shooting with a, a uh, consistent technique. For sure, for sure. Um, last couple, mate. Um, so, obviously, with a player like Sarah, you spoke about there was a glaring issue and you were able to adjust that. What about with Jazz? You said you still gave her some feedback. I mean, like you said, she's one of the best shooters ever. Um, what gives you sort of that, that confidence as a coach to still be willing to make those adjustments and encouraging coaches to still coach? Um, shooting because, like you said, it's it's hard. If you've got a player that's pretty good, you don't want to tweak, even if you think there's something there. What do you sort of say it, to coaches like that? It's interesting. Uh, Jazz, obviously, Phil Shelley. Everyone, I'm sure everyone knows Phil. Like, uh, I think the whole of Australia knows Phil. He's a shooting coach. Yeah. Uh, so here am I. I get uh, Jazz Shelley come in. So I, the first couple of sessions, I just sort of evaluated. I built a bit of a trust with her, and then I talked about keeping her shoulders open and keeping that like looking through that window again. Yep. You saw in the video, she tended to, to rotate that shoulder across. And uh, to me, um, I was able to do that by building trust with her, just talking, communicating with her. And um, I, just subtle thing, hey, try this, see what you think. But um, due to her background and everything like that, I, I, I just, I took my time with her a little bit and went, hey, try this. And I, I can't say that I changed her form or technique that much, but there was just little tweaks yeah, helped and made a little difference. So, no, that, that's great. That's great, um, coach. Obviously, um, thank you so much for your time. I think there was there was a lot in there and a lot of relevance as we sort of discussed um, in the lead up. That um, obviously, you know, the coaches can send those drills out to their players now, and and they can work on that before we get back in, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, but they can certainly start to work on some of those things and just the detail with um, how you went through that shot technique was was great and certainly. I mean, I know I picked up things, but I'm sure um, all the coaches involved picked up things on that technique and things to, to reinforce. And, and, and the big thing I'm you know, taking is just have that confidence to coach shooting as well and, and, and you know, the importance of that. So um, that, was, that was really good and appreciate your time. No worries. Thank you. All right. Um, that will do us coaches for tonight. Thank you um, so much for, for tuning in. Uh, thanks for your questions. Sorry I didn't get to all of them. Um, there was a lot coming through in both uh, clinics today, which shows the engagement, and um, we'll see you later. Thank you.